And here the Lord is speaking to the prophet Ezekiel after uh, giving him an inside uh, look at what's going on with the religious leaders of Israel uh, and the days right before God destroyed it. Ezekiel 8, 13, he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Thomas. Thomas was the Babylonian uh, god, supposedly the son of God, and uh, to celebrate Thomas, they had a little sign they made, kind of like a T. <laughs> then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose, a custom they had of putting a branch like a mistletoe up alongside the face to throw to the air in the holy exercises. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Your attention is called the last verse. Therefore will I deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Father, help us to understand this passage and help this congregation this morning to grasp the reality of this truth, that there comes a time when you're dealing with men where no mercy is available and where no pity is left. And may they never be deceived into accepting this modern Santa Claus hugging, kissing type of a God that always forgives and always overlooks and never pours out wrath. Uh, Father, make the reality of this truth real to our hearts and those that hear. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk this morning about no mercy, no mercy. The passage I've just read you and other passages like it, the Lord says scores of times that there comes a time in his dealings with men in which he absolutely refuses to put up with them anymore. And we have a fable going abroad in our land today that you can hear in almost any modernistic church. And the fable is that, well, you know, well, God is merciful. It'll come out all right. Uh, God's love. God's good. I trust it'll be all right. Well, you know, God will be merciful. I've talked to people in town that think they're going to get to heaven because God is merciful. Listen, God is merciful to the just and the unjust alike. And don't ever mistake God's mercy for his salvation. His salvation is eternal, but his mercy is not. The Bible says the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. But the context of that statement is his mercy toward the nation of Israel. They get second chance the Lord comes back. There's not one statement in the Bible that says God extends mercy to an individual forever. And the modernistic teaching is that God is merciful and God wouldn't hurt a flea. And it's strange to me how a modernistic preacher can stand and minister with five wars going on at the same time and talk about God being merciful and God being good and never recognize the fact that God lets people die of cancer. God lets people live on needle shots that have diabetes. God lets boys come home with no arms and no legs. God let people be born in this world blind. God lets people come into this world with leprosy, eating up their stumps. God allows terrible accidents to happen. The God, the modernist, is an ostrich. He's an ostrich. When you hear a man talk about God is love, God is mercy, you're de dealing with an unrealistic, abstract theorizer that's way out in left field. He don't know where he's at. Uh, I, like the, I like the God that knows when I have problems and troubles. I like the God that understands when a boy comes back from overseas blind as a bat or with a hole through his head. That's the God of reality. This God that's just as good to everybody, nice to everybody, he's a faker, he's a piker, he's a skunk. Away with him! As far as I'm concerned, they can carry banners saying that God is dead. Let him die, brother. Let him check out. Listen, the God of that Bible is not just a God of love and mercy. The God of that Bible says in this place here, I'll not pity, I'll not spare, I'll pour it out. In Ezekiel one time he says, I'll no longer have compassion. One time he said in Ezekiel, though Daniel, Noah, and Job were in that city, I wouldn't spare it. He said that the three most righteous men that buy in that city, I'd kill them off and the babies clean up for the granddaddies. Now, folks don't like that. 
You know what I think modernistic people think? I think they think God is the author of everything that's good, and everything that's bad that happens is man's lack of education, and if you diseducate him enough, he'll clear up his problem. That's, that's what they really think. And did you know something? The same God, the same God that said, to suffer the little children to come unto me, said, Depart from me, you cursed and everlasting fire. And that wasn't one of man's mistakes. And the same psalmist that wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, wrote, Let them be cast in a deep pits, let coals of fire fall on the head. And listen, the same God that said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, said, Because I called you refuse, and I stretched out my hands, and no man regarded, I'll laugh when your calamity comes, I'll mock when your fear comes upon you as desolation. That's the God of the Bible. So I'm going to talk about no mercy. There comes a time when God just refused to put up with a man's foolishness anymore. And when that time comes, it comes. Uh, you've seen this thing in life. Uh, you've seen a woman full up with a man that just drinks and drinks and drinks, and she loves him, and she puts up with him, and he's unfaithful to her, and she puts up with him, and she puts up with him, and she puts up with him, and she gives him the first time, forgives him the second time, forgives him the third time, forgives him the fourth time, and then one day, bam, down comes the gate, brother, and it's closed. I mean, good. I mean, there isn't any reconciliation. I've seen that thing happen a dozen times. Same thing happens with men. Men will sometimes put up with a nagging, griping, cantankerous, complaining wife that's just a load and a burden, just put up with it one year, two years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, and one day it's just, and that's the end of it. They're then they're getting back together again. In plain of words, a man that thinks God is always merciful is an unrealistic fool, is what he is. But it isn't even true in human relations. Uh, there comes a time when you put up with it and put up with it, and it's drawn. Well, I'll tell you, there comes a time where you've just had enough, and enough is enough. And when it's over, down she comes. I'll prove my thesis. There was no mercy in the days of Noah. Noah sat down at the table one night, and he said, boys, I'm going to build a boat. And she had said, that's fine, Daddy. Whatever you say is all right. You're the patriarch in the family. And Japheth says, well, good. We get to go fishing, huh? <laughs> and the old man said, no, we're not going to build a little fishing boat. We're going to build a boat that's 300 yards long and 50 yards wide. And Japheth said, he'd been working out in the sun too much. I told you would get him after a while. And Shem said, no, whatever Daddy says goes, that's it. So they began to build a boat. And they built a boat 300 yards long and 50 yards wide, as big as the Queen Mary. And they built that thing out between the valleys and the mountain where there wasn't a creek big enough to float a canoe. And every day the folks came around there and gathered around the hillside and watched them build that thing. And that was the great sport back in Noah's day. They called it arkin. And instead of going fishing or hunting, they went arkin. And everybody would come in there and say, let's go arkin. And they'd go down and watch Noah build a boat. And say, look at that crazy fool building that boat. And they'd sit around there and the students would say, why that prehistoric fanatic, that medieval crackpot, gonna rain, gonna rain, water come down of the air. Who ever heard of water coming down of the air? Why, science says, you know, you've always had those crackpots in every generation. Science says, as if that meant anything, science says water can't come down, water always comes up from below. Why, who, why they'll take that phone lock him up. Somebody said, you want to let him get away with that poor? What about here in a sanitarium? The fellow's crazy. And he kept on building that ark and building that ark and producing the pressure got on, you know, and Japheth and Shem began to kind of twist under it, you know, and to be connected with this kind of thing. And that boat went on and on, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And they'd come down there and say, it's going to rain, is it, Noah? Yeah, it's going to rain. Rain, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's going to rain. Come down to the sky, huh, Noah? <laughs> going to pour down the clouds, huh, Noah? <laughs> going to rain up up there. Water down up there, huh? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. You know, he's out of his mind. And they go up there, and that big geology professor would say, now, according to the latest finds of science, it is all that blah, you know. And, and Noah would say, it's going to rain, it's coming, it's coming. And somebody said, do you mean to tell me God's going to drown all those little babies? And Noah said he's going to drown every one of them. And somebody said, why, you hate monger. You gospel of hate. You bigot. You prejudiced, dogmatic. Why, the best scholars say, why, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> and Noah would say, it's going to rain. And somebody said, you mean tell me God's going to drown all those crippled folks and all those folks up in their 80s that can't get out of bed, drown them? Would God do that? Noah said, you're going to be a washout. You're going to be a gully washer. It's going to come. You better get in the boat. And then one day all those animals came across the hills two by two and came down the valleys and one fellow looked over there and he said, great day in the morning. He said, my granddaddy told me about that animal there. 
Well, I never seen what my granddaddy saw one of them. Them things live 700 miles from here. Well, I'm glad looking out across there and said, well, now, what's that thing there? They don't come from around here. And the fellow said, well, according to the textbook, this thing comes from down Central Africa. Well, I'm said, well, it must have taken him two years to get here. And they got watching those things, all those animals went in the ark, right up the gang plank into the ark, without fighting, without fighting. I'd like to see you get a bunch of lions and tigers and, and leopards and elephants and rhinoceroses, r- rhinoceri, reeses, roses, rhesopossipuses, <laughs> hippopotamuses, and giraffes and dogs and cats. I'd like to see you get them all together and pair them off for twos and get them to make a journey like that without fighting or eating each other. You know something the folks in Noah's day saw the greatest miracle the world's ever seen up to that time, and none of them believed it. And they saw those animals going in there two by two, and somebody said, boy, maybe there's something to it. And somebody said, oh, you weaken it, you fall in that stuff. They're just using emotionalism, you know, it's trying to work on your feelings. You know, nothing to that, nothing to that. Trying to get you stirred up, evangelistic talk, blah, blah. And all these animals going in there, pretty soon the door shuts. One night the Lord woke old North in the middle of the night and said, okay, get in. He woke all the children up and said, let's get in. One of them said, well, thank God this mess over with, let's go. And they went in there and got inside that thing. They hadn't been in there 15 minutes. And Shem said, you know something, Daddy, I think you, think you got it right. I think you got it right. And Japheth said, it sure is quiet in here. Here, this thing got 20,000 animals on it and ain't a sound, ain't a peep. And they got in there and boy, along about 5 o'clock in the morning, the sky began to turn dark and those thunderheads began to come up. And about 5.30 in the morning, those folks in Noah's day were all up and down that valley and they heard that thing going, boom, 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 my like God. Somebody woke up and said, what's that? What's that? So all the blasting down the plant again, you know. And the thing went along that way for about 10 minutes and boom, 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 like that. And boy, about 6.30 in the morning, that valley began to fill with people, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, out of wind, shh, began to pick up across that valley. And somebody said, open, Noah, open. And he said, I can't open. My Lord shut me in. Did you ever read that thing there? It got locked from outside. And he said, I, I can't let you in. Then crowbars and that ark, see, people banging there and screaming. And Noah, Noah, open the door. Something's gone wrong. Open up, Noah, open up, Noah. And Noah and his boys up there 100 feet in the air looking down over the side of that ship at 7 o'clock in the morning. And Noah said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I preached you the truth. I gave it to you right the way it was, straight across the plate, waist high, year in and year out. Yeah, I'm sorry. From here on, there's no mercy. And boy, the heavens turned black like sackcloth and ashes, and those streaked forks of lightning began to hammer across that landscape, and down she came, boy. And I mean, that rain came down to do what it said in the Bible, it had to come down at a rate of about seven feet an hour. And what happens? Here's a mother up on top of the house top with a baby, screaming, my baby, my baby, my baby, my darling, going off down there. What happened in the Johnstown flood? A man that thinks God's most for, for forever is dangerous. He's dangerous. You can deceive a whole nation with that kind of nonsense. And here's a baby floating off on a spar and floating off on a, on a rooftop. Here's a man climbing a tree and the water comes up. He gets to the rooftop. The water comes up. The house goes off. Here's a geology professor using the rocks for something practical for a change. And he's climbing up that mountain. That water is coming up. And he goes high and the water comes up. Here's the biology professor scrambling up there with his butterfly samples and his bifocals falling down across his face. And that water coming up, 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 up. And it kept raining and it kept raining. That old boat begins to move there and shift around and slip there. People hanging on the sides, scratching at the doors, screaming, No, no, open it, open it, open it. And Noah says, Sorry, no mercy. Shut goes the window. That's it. That's it. That's it. Baby's one year old, two year old, six weeks old, seven months old, granddad, grandma, people in crutches, people with diabetes, people with cancer, hospital beds floating off down the thing in mattresses, people with bandages all over them, people on the operating table, down comes the rain, out goes the doctor, out go the nurses. Folks, I'll tell you, there comes a time in God's dealing with men when he's had enough, and when he's had enough, he's had enough. And some of you want to say, people sitting here this morning, and perhaps some of you listening over the radio, you think because God has put up with you, and put up with you, and put up with you, that you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven unless the wrath of God falls out on somebody else other than you. And if you haven't accepted a blood atonement where the wrath of God came down with no mercy, you're not going to make heaven, no matter how God, uh, how, how good God is to you. I get so sick and tired of some of these southern folks sometimes. 
Well, the Yankees got their problems too. But these Southerners, you know, oh, God has sure been good to us, Brother Pete. I don't know what I'd do if it wasn't for the good Lord. <laughs> Brother said, I just don't want I'd do if it wasn't for the man upstairs. Listen, you know what the Lord can do to you? He can put clothes on your back and put food in your face and give you good health for 90 years and land you flat in the lake of fire. He said, there's so much of people. He said, I put up with you to here, and after here, down she comes. No mercy in Noah's day. No mercy in Lot's day. A modernist, a man that teaches God his love and doesn't forget and forgets to tell you that our God is consuming fire, that man is unrealistic, unscientific, unnatural, and lacks common sense. Uh, who could ever who could ever watch the A-bomb drop in Hiroshima and go off saying that God is love and put the period there? Wouldn't you have to add a little postscript to something? I bet you those folks down on that bomb didn't think God was love. Just depends which end of the receiving stick you on. You know, in uh, Lot's day there was no mercy. Lot was down there in town one night, knocked at the door, and two angels showed up. And they said, Lot, boy, you better pack your dirt and hit the road. We're going to burn this place to smithereens. And Lot said, oh, me, oh, my, oh, goodness. And he called his wife and said, honey, pack the stuff. We've got to go. And she got the two girls said, all right, pack, honey. We've got to go. We've got to leave town. And Mrs. Lot was saying, oh, I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was just, things were just too good to last. And she began to throw this stuff in the suitcase. Well, the daughter went out and tried to warm up the car, you know, and stepped in the starter, and it went, ah, uh ah. -huh. Uh -huh. That's the most horrible sound in the world when you're in a hurry, you know, ah. Uh -huh. And she said, oh, what are we going to do? And Lot said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's uh, Betsy and where's Susie? And she said, oh, they're down there at the key club. And the old man said, hold the phone, I'll get them. And went tear out of the house and went down Pig Alley. Fast he go, went by the Trader John and the rest of them. Went down there, back to the alley, passed those upholstered sewers. And got down there and stopped at some little old apartment house and knocked at the door. A little old stood opening the door. And a drunken face leered out there and said, there you are, old man. And Lot said, uh, I came to get my girls. I came to get my girls. Well, that's too bad. We're having a little old party in here. Come on, have a drink. And Lot said, you've got my daughters. My daughters are married to you. We've got to leave. Pack your stuff. We've got to get out of town. God's going to burn this place. And that drunken face said, God's going to burn this place. He's going to burn this place. He said, honey, God's going to burn this place. Come here. <laughs> and pretty soon his daughter pokes her head through the transom, and she's drunk too, and she says, hee, hee, hi, daddy. And Lot said, honey, God's going to burn this place. We've got to get out of town. We've got to go. Pack your stuff and leave. And then another face shows up there and says, listen, old man, you're going to be fat like old Uncle Abraham. You were, what are you, a white horse preacher or something? Who do you think you're trying to kid? God's going to burn this place. God's going to burn this place. Why, God love, God wouldn't burn it. By the hell, old fanatic, go about your business. Bam, down came the slide door. Lot goes back up the street in the sweat. Oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. Back gets to the house, runs in. They got the stuff about packed. And about that time, the two angels say, you ain't got another minute. And they grab hands through there and haul them out the door. They got time just to take a satchel, a purse, and a billful with them. And out they went across those plains. And out they went there with the angels leading them. And pretty soon that sky began to turn lowering in red. Big old red thunderheads coming up there. And pretty soon that hisses like a shell going over and Lot screams and doubles his steps, and Mrs. Lot turns around and takes one look back at the old homestead, and Lot and his children crash through the city gates of Zoar, and as they turn around, there's Mrs. Lot back there about 200 yards looking at that thing and saying, Oh, my linen. Oh, my laces. Oh, my chinaware. Oh, 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 my beautiful split-level home. Oh, my zoya grass. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's right, brother. Human nature don't change any. And she's standing back there looking about all that stuff she bought over in France and Germany, you know, and pile up there in that big old rug, and she's, oh, oh, and that thing comes across there, and boy, all of a sudden that whole ground just turns up light, bright red and orange, and the flame goes up for a mile across and a quarter of a mile deep. And let me tell you something, in that town, if uh, Mike Wallace and the news camera had been on the scene, they'd have pulled that camera in there, and you'd have seen men 50 and 60 and 70 years old with their skin turning red and then purple and then blistering and popping and the water and fat running out of those faces, and you would have heard babies screaming for mamas, like you saw the picture of that little baby in Bond out Shanghai back in 1938, and you'd have seen mothers running with their children in their arms and both of them turning into flaming torches and rolling on the ground and screaming and a man that thinks God doesn't know that's going on and a man that doesn't believe God is powerful enough to stop that is a fool. Yeah. Listen, the God I serve could have stopped that thing right in the middle of it. The, the, the God of this modernist, he hadn't got any power. He's a clown.
He's an idiot. Away with him. Listen, a God that can't reach down there and stop you from burning when you get ready to burn, he ain't God. He ain't God. He's something else these fellas thought up in college. Listen, the God I serve could have reached down in Noah's day and saved every man, woman, and child right there, but he didn't. He didn't. The God I serve could have reached down when you're burning and leaving your house with your baby in your arms and cut off the flames like that and get you out with first-degree burns instead of third-degree burns. You see, the God of the modernists, he's a phony. He's a flip. He isn't anything. The God of this Bible knows what's going on, allows it to go on, and there comes a time when God is dealing when there's no mercy. Folks say, well, that's way back in those old days, Brother Ruckman. You have to come up to date and not be so negative. Look at it positively. Well, I know one thing about you. You never had any trouble. You never had any trouble. You've never been through much. Listen, there was no mercy in the 18th century. There was no mercy in the 19th century. There was no mercy in the 20th century. Did you read about that charge at Balaclava by the Light Brigade when those old British boys fell off the horses and fell them on the cannon? You know what those Russians did to them? They cut them up slow with knives. I mean slow. They didn't cut them up fast. They cut them up slow. Somebody said, well, that's man. You mean God doesn't know what man's doing? You said, well, that's man mistake. You mean God can't overrule man mistake? Some God, some little old tiddly-winky-pinky God that can't overrule your mistakes. Some little clown of a God that doesn't know what you're doing. Uh, some little marionette, some little puppet of a God that can't keep things right down here, isn't it? I'll tell you, if I was serving a God that couldn't straighten out messes like that and stop them, I'd just kick him out the window and get me a better one. Listen, the God of that Bible knows that kind of stuff takes place, allows that kind of stuff to take place, and the reason why he does it is there comes the time in God's dealing with men when it's mercy, 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 and then no mercy. If I'm talking to somebody here this morning that's unsaved, don't you think for a minute because you're in good health and well clothed this morning and well fed that God's going to get you through the pearly gates. He might put you right in the bottomless pit. On June 25th, 1875, a man named uh, Sitting Bull and a man named Eagle Elk and a man named White Bull got some Sioux Indians together and they entrapped a group of men under a man named General Custer. Folks say, well, that's way back. Oh, it isn't too far back. Let's see, 1875. It isn't 100 years ago. I mean, telegraph in those days. And uh, they trapped him out there, and you know what Custer told his men before Custer's last stand? He said, don't take too many prisoners, he said. To get in the fight, don't take too many Indians prisoner. He got shot off his horse before the battle ever started. He wasn't in the middle of the fight. Well, they got in there, and they got ringed up by those Indians, and pretty soon the dust clouds began to rise. You can't have 200 horses driving around not choking on dust. And you know something? In that crowd there, there were boys, 19, 20, and 21 years old, on their knees in that dirt with no water, breathing that dust, and those hoofs drumming by, and those arrows flying, arrows in the shoulder, arrows in the stomach, arrows in the, in the thighs and knees, falling on the ground there, screaming and praying, wounded, Indians getting off the horses, coming and scalping them alive, and haul off the scalp while the man was still screaming. And when they got through and wiped out every man in that group, Two fellows tried to play dead and get away, and the Indian women came out with knives to mutilate those dead people, and those two fellows got up and ran, and they shot them in the back with arrows. You say, how many got out? None of them got out. How many got up the Alamo? None of them got out. You say, well, God is lost. Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. God is love, and our God is consuming fire. You know what the Lord will do? He'll allow the thing to go just so far, and then whoosh, down she comes. And when she comes, that's all she wrote. That's it. Why, there are people all over Pensacola that think because they have food and clothing and are in good health that they're saved. You're not saved unless you come to a place where the wrath of God is poured out. That Bible said, he that spared not his own son, spared not his own son. Look at here. Here's a sinless man, never cussed, never stole, never lied, never swore, never cheated, never exaggerated, never had an impure thought. And he's hanging up there, and the mercy gives out, and he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God is love? How quaint. How quaint. If God is love, why would he forsake a sinless man and pour out his wrath upon him? Listen, God is love, that's half of it, and the rest of it is our God is a consuming fire. Folks say, well, the trouble of this generation is preachers like uh, you that go around negative and down on folks and talking about the wrath of God and mad and hating folks and always talking about wrath and this and that. And if we just get rid of you, we get the thing fixed up fine. Oh, you might not. You get all of us fellows and the Lord might really pour it out. 
You know, one time uh, Moses and Jeremiah got praying, and Jeremiah said, Lord, he said, remember those folks, and remember that I stood in the way to turn the wrath of God from them. You know, you know the way you can turn the wrath of God from a people or from a nation is by preaching about the wrath of God and scaring them to death. That's all you keep the wrath from coming. One time old Jonah came down to Nineveh, and he said, Yet in forty days and forty nights Nineveh shall be overthrown. Somebody said, You forgot part of your message, Jonah. He said, Man, I didn't forget none of it. Forty days and forty nights, that's it. Somebody said, Noah, what about the chance to repent? No chance to repent. Somebody said, What about the invitation? No invitation. Jonah chapter 3 says, Forty days and forty nights, brother, you've had it, that's it. And somebody said, but, but Jonah, for goodness sake, give us a chance to get it right. No chance, 40 days, that's it. Somebody said, but preach something positive. Tell us how God loves us. 40 days, 40 nights, that's it. That's it. And you know something? Uh, they got right. They got right, and God spared them for a while. But you know why he spared them? Because old Jonah preached the wrath to them, boy, and scared them. They got right. Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Folks say, well, in the 20th century, things are different, Brother Ruckman. You can no longer use fear as a motive. Yeah. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why, fear is just good a motive in the 20th century as it ever was back there 20 centuries before. Well, one day, much of fellows got in a plane in the 20th century. They flew over a city in the 20th century, and they dropped something out of the bottom of this plane in the 20th century. And a flash came into the plane through welder's glasses. man sitting in the plane had a welder's glasses, and when this thing he dropped hit below him, better than 40,000 feet, he saw the light through welder's glasses. There was a bluish-green flame. Fifteen minutes later, four blasts shook the plane. Purple fire went 10,000 feet high. A giant mushroom seethed out of the top to 45,000 feet and could be seen 200 miles out at sea. It was rose-colored at the bottom. The second one they dropped, they dropped at 60,000 feet, and it killed 53,000 people. God is love. 53,000 men, women, and children. God is love. I believe God is love. I believe that's half of it. I believe a man that takes half and doesn't take the rest is not sane. Isn't it strange how a fellow can pick up a newspaper and watch telecasts and see all this stuff and put that over there and then put God over here? Isn't that peculiar? See, God is love. He's over here. Then the 10 o'clock newscast is over there. <laughs> well, listen, the God that gave you birth and gave you life and gives you breath knows everything that's going on the 10 o'clock newscast and controls it and runs it and guides it. God not something over here that just helps you out and give you a sugar stick to, stuck on, to suck on while this stuff goes on over here. Listen, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the God of God so loved the world is the God that allowed the revolution, the riot in Chicago and Cleveland and Washington when the houses were burned and the people were raped and the stores were broken into. A God that's all love is crooked. A God that loves everybody and everything is a moral pervert. A God that loves injustice and unholiness and indecency and filth and wickedness, as well as he loves period and holiness, is a crook. Away with him. I wouldn't have such a God given the bomb's rush. He's nothing but a bomb. You know when that bomb dropped, that second bomb dropped, you know what they counted? They counted 600 dead every day for a week thereafter. Total who died from burns, 80,000. The water was contaminated, trees were blackened and scarred, a uh, mother, case after case happened where the mother was killed and the baby was alive, born while the thing was going on. Mother killed and the baby alive. Flying glass was seen at 15,000 feet from where the bomb went off. Miscarriages and premature infants at 6,000 feet. The shock of that thing is so great, women would give birth prematurely, 6,000, a mile from it. Fire started 13,000 feet away, charred telephone poles were found at 10,000 feet, and the roof tile on the houses, tile like they use these old Spanish homes, at 5,000 feet that tile bubbled just like it was boiling. Folks say, well, God is love. Well, you got part of it. You got part of it. Now, if you want to be sane, take the rest of it. I wonder how do you have felt down there when that thing dropped? That thing didn't drop back in the days of latter days of Noah. That thing dropped in your lifetime. Most of you. All right. Calvary, I say this in closing, Calvary was God's last demonstration of love. When we tell folks God so loved the world, we've got to tell them, love not the world, neither the things in the world. 
and we tell them that God loved people enough to die for them on the cross, we have to tell them that all that is in the world is not of the Father, but is of the world. See, the two parts of that thing. And the last time God ever showed his love was at Calvary. Now, God shows his mercy since then. Some of you folks may live to a ripe old age and then spend eternity in hell because God was merciful to you in this life. But there comes a time when he's through. The classic illustration is the illustration of a man that uh, was out in the street about to be hit by a car, and another man shoved him out of the way and got him safe and suffered a broken leg for it. And later on, uh, this fellow who was saved and was shoved out of the way was arraigned in court before a judge on a certain charge. And he said to the judge, why, I remember you. You were the man that saved my life about five years ago. And the judge said to that man, that's right, he said, I was your savior then, but now I'm your judge. And the Lord Jesus Christ is your savior now, but there come a time when he'll be your judge. And this morning it's whosoever will, let him come. And then after a while, after a while, depart me, works of iniquity, I never knew you. I hope God will give you the grace to see that and do something about it.